Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yifong, and with me I'm at Carlos Lilly and Diane. Greetings. Hey. Hey, guys. This week, uh, what we do in this podcast, we watch uh, a film or series of shorts, and we talk about it. That's what we do on podcasts. And uh, this week we've picked uh, Der Rosen Cavalier, which is The Night of the Rose, uh, in 1925, that's when they were in production, but it was released in 1926. It's the final entry into Robert Wayne's uh, filmography that is that we have access to. Let's put it that way. I am not sure if um, there are there are probably most likely more films that aren't available on YouTube or uh, things that are accessible to people. Um, that's running in uh, film festivals. But uh, beyond that, uh, at least for the purpose of our podcast, we've come to the end of his filmography of the list of films that's accessible to us. So, and what a final movie entry. <laughs> um, we will get to that. Yeah, and before we get to that, though, let's just uh, do a real quick what we've been watching. Uh, anything you guys seen uh, in the last couple of weeks? That would be constitutes a, a sort of a classic movie in the classic realm. I call it. Uh, uh, I feel like I just watched something recently, but nothing, nothing to the extent of it being a classic. Of course. Ugh. Well, last week I know we talked about Hitchcock, and uh, so I watched a couple of Hitchcock films, and that was last week. The one that I really enjoyed was... Um, you mean since last week? You've seen additional Hitchcock no, films? No. Oh, okay. No, that was just last week. But I, I did like Blackmail very much. I see. Yeah, I, I was did. thinking in the interim since we were recorded or... No, or... haven't had time. Life has just been <laughs> rushing by. Yeah, likewise. Same here. I'm sure I've seen... Uh, I feel like I watched something and I just can't remember now. <laughs> It's the, it's the problem I have is I often just uh, not remember the details of whatever it is. Oh, you know what I what I watched? Uh, it's more of a modern classic. Is the uh, I can't remember yet. Mid eighties, uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly, which is a remake of the nineteen fifties The Fly. Help me! Away. How's that? Help me! <laughs> <laughs> well, you're. I, have you, have you seen either or the fifties one version? Yeah, that's a lot tamer. That's for sure. Oh, I'm sure it is. The yeah, the eighties one is basically over the top, so it, it's just uh, incredibly gory. So if you're, is it a it, slasher film? I I've, I've heard of it. I've never watched it because obviously a fly. Ew, gross. No. <laughs> well. I I don't remember if I fully watched the old black and white. I, I may have seen bits and pieces that I, I really can't remember. Um, but the premise, I think, is the same for both movies, which is that a guy figured out uh, how to teleport between one pod and another. Uh, and he teleported himself. And then a fly got in and then basically spliced this gene together. Ugh. <laughs> and so he became, in his genetic makeup, sort of like half man half uh fly hybrid at least that was more the 80s version i've dated guys like that before (laughs) 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 that is a classic for sure diane that line is a classic (laughs) (laughs) but yeah it, it was a great movie it's just uh you know, but that's normal for David Cronenberg. His his almost all of his film, not every, but uh, a big chunk of his filmography is just really gory, and uh, and he is obviously trying to communicate something. But it's just uh, it's not for everyone, that's for sure. <laughs> so, oh, Jeff Goldblum's in it. Okay, yeah, yeah Gina yeah, Davis. Oh, I man. think I'm not a big '80s movie fan. I mean, I should be, but I'm not. I don't think I I was watching a lot of movies in the 80s, but I think that was one of the films that basically made his career. I mean, he's a lot, he's had a lot more movies afterwards, but for him, that was his calling card, I think, for a while. 
So that really catapulted him from whatever he was doing before. Best as I understand. But anyway, um, I would still consider that classic. I mean, that's already, what is that, like 40 years ago now, I think. Is it 40? Let me see. No, it one, says two, three, um, one, 86. Two, three, 30 years. So 30-something years. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to say it, but I'm going to. Time flies. Oh, yes. Had Absolutely. to say it. I had to. <laughs> that, that's a zinger well when you said the 80s i well i guess something i did recently watch a few weeks ago they had something about mtv because it's been about 30 no 40 years since it's been on the air technically next year is its 40th anniversary i don't know why they can never wait till the actual decade of the years they have to do like one before it so i watched that about mtv which is the 80s so yay go me it was interesting. Yeah. Well, I was a I was a big fan of MTV. So, uh, what did you think of it, Lily? Was it good? <laughs> I don't think Lily was born yet. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But I mean, I love eighties rock. You know, so it was it was just really interesting. I <laughs> I follow like Billy Idol on social media, so he posted something about it. So obviously they were talking about him on it. So I was like, oh cool, I'll I'll watch the MTV thing. <laughs> So that's why I watched it. So I'm cool. <laughs> but yeah, I um, it was you know unique seeing it from the ground up. It was you know what they had to do to build it because it was kind of a free for all, and then all these people came together, and then you know things happen, and they're like why they're not playing certain artists, and then the company rules, and then getting thrown out, and then cre- having to create the logo, just like unique stuff like that. But did video kill the radio star? <laughs> uh, I honestly couldn't tell you. Maybe YouTube did. But they said at the end, YouTube's great because, you know, you can see any of these music videos at any time. But, you know, we don't have Ethong's giant-ass TV, so <laughs> we can't see him at the grand <laughs> scale. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it won't matter on a gigantic screen because the video quality was pretty poor <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, that's so. true. Probably worse for for uh, compared to even some of the silent films that we watch, just because really? I remember watching them. Yeah, when some they of first them were debuted. pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, it's just they use like VHS VCR just to to make those products, and those haven't aged well. <laughs> so, no. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so appears to be a eighties uh, theme podcast. This one, hopefully, our uh, Movie is going to be very eighties like. <laughs> in some ways, it is. It's, in some it ways, reminded it reminded me of Marie Antoinette, but <laughs> I don't know. They, I think they made that film in the nineties with Kirsten Dunst. Maybe the two thousands. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's much later. But um, yeah. So let's let's just get right into it. Um, again, Robert Wayne's final film entry, uh, nineteen twenty six, and uh, it was initially. I love the inception of the idea, which was that this particular film, The Night of the Rose, this work was ori- originally an operetta written by, musically written by uh, Richard Strauss, who I don't know if people are even familiar with classical music in general, but he's basically been hailed traditionally as the uh, successor to people like the Mozarts, the Beethovens, etc. I mean, those big names people know but i i think that uh the modern equivalent in which uh this film was contemporaries with in this work with uh, richard strauss and, and so having uh, a work that was by him is i in my opinion astronomical but so he is the music sort of artisan for it but it was um the original operetta or li- libra libretto by Hugo Hoffmannsthal and he's the guy that sort of uh, dreamed up all this stuff I mean he ultimately he and uh, Rich Strauss basically created this and it was based on a novel um, I don't know how I'm going to pronounce this but I'll try it's a Louvre de Couvray and it is a loose adaptation of that work as well as another uh, comedy Moliere's uh, Monsieur de 
poor Shutnak. <laughs> Sorry if I'm butchering all of these names, but uh, it was, you know, all, basically it's a it's a mishmash of novels, comedian, stage work uh, that created the stage um, comic operata uh, in three acts. And the initial inception of this is 1911, uh, and it was first performed in the Conic Clears uh, Opera Opera House, which is in Dresden, one of the most popular, well-known pop, uh, opera houses really ever. But, I, you know, I'm not like a, a opera fan, so I don't really know all these details. I'm just reading from the Wikipedia. Mm. The initial direction was uh, by Max uh, Reinhardt, which we know because we've heard his name countless times before in relation to his innovation for German expressionism. So, especially on the stage. And of course, you know, his link with uh, Robert Wien is Dr. Caligari, right? And Hansel Orlick and many other works of the expressionism era. So, it's no surprise that they all, all these groups of people, artisans, all know each other, right? So, those parts aren't surprised because they're all basically hanging around the same circles. But uh, this film, basically the plot line of the film itself uh, is... It, it, it's hard to summarize because a lot happens in the film. But essentially, you've got uh, basically something like a love triangle or more. And you've got, you know, it tackles multiple themes of like infidelity, of... Um, of uh, you know, uh, parent and child sort of in marriage, and it, it it just ultimately dealt with a lot of stuff. But the plot itself is pretty straightforward, in the sense that uh, you've got uh, a, a prince and a princess who marry each other uh, without sort of falling in love. It was kind of like a range, I guess, and. But the prince is off to war, and now the prince is by herself, and of course she has an affair with uh, an, an, another character uh, who is kind of like a womanizer, playboy character. And that particular character essentially is our main star of the title, the Knight of the Rose. That is him. And uh, he falls in love with a girl that the prince's cousin is trying to marry and get rich off of. And... Uh, so, you know, it, it essentially the hilarity ensues in, t- in terms of the rest of the plot line. <laughs> a lot of back and forth. In fact, I feel like it's very Shakespearean. So, anyways, so uh, it's in terms of the theme of this film, I really felt like it was a, a, a grand departure from what Robert Wayne normally tackles, at least if based on the films that are available, once again, to us. Um... I know you weren't there in the beginning when we were talking about this, Diane, but uh, I, I know Lily was. We talked about Fear and even Caligari and Hans Orlock and all these works. He, again, seems to be very focused on uh, sort of the dark recesses of humanity and the impulses there. And in some ways, some of those themes are still here, but not uh, in like in the shadows of the darkness, right? Uh, in, if anything, this film highlights that shadow and darkness on the interior character level, which is actually pretty amazing. So I would say that his tendencies towards those uh, types of films uh, are... He has basically departed out of that. I, I was concerned in the beginning that I'm basically saying like, well, I wish all of his films weren't like that because I don't really think that most directors are one note type directors they tend to sort of diversify their works and try to do new things and uh, so that was my fear in going in because we had seen a string of them right apparently those happen to be the ones that are preserved at least as early works but i would say starting with inri which is about essentially the passion of christ uh story that was a big departure um and what was the last one before the Night of the Rose? What was the one? Uh, was there another uh, one? No. Uh, we did Fear. We did Night of the Rose. We did Caligari. We did. No, maybe it's just Hans these two. Then. I thought there was one more. We did. 
Yeah, I can't. Oh, that think was Hitchcock. Okay, sorry, that was totally different. So, yeah, so these two films makes me feel like he's probably done a heck of a lot more than this, and we just unfortunately have access to only a, a limited amount of film titles that he has. So, anyways, but so you kind of came into this towards the end of his filmography, Diane. So, what you what do you think about this one? I was overwhelmed by it. I thought it was extremely well done. Uh, they talked last week when we, or the week before when we talked about INRI. Um, they talked about the uh, thousands of cast members that had to make up the film, and this film really did have thousands and thousands of people in it. It was just an, uh, an extraordinary production. Um, I think that, uh, it was done to the nth degree that it would be like a, um, von Stroheim film where you had realism in the costumes, in the way that people behaved. Um, it was a fantasy, but it was extremely well done. Um, I enjoyed the cast. I thought that it really was a comedy. You didn't have to go searching for the comedy in there. And it didn't hit you in the face, but it just went along in a very smooth fashion. Um, But it did have some extremely funny moments in it, I thought. And it moved right along. Uh, It's it's not the shortest film in the world, but uh, it kept me interested the entire time. Hmm. I would have to agree on that. Yeah, Lily, what did you think of it? Um, well, I compared it, even though I haven't seen it, Mary, they haven't seen Marie Antoinette, just that whole style of, uh, you know, that time period, the big, big dresses and, you know, the fancy outfits the men wore. I also enjoyed it just from watching all of Robert Wayne's other films. You know, this is quite different. There's, I mean, I guess you could say in one sense, you know, the characters' minds are not deteriorating, but, the, you know, they're suffering internally because, you know, their lovers don't love them or vice versa. And they love someone else. So we kind of see that type of psyche issues. But I I mean, I also enjoyed it. It was long. I some Some parts I kind of lost connection with like what was going on because the prince and the princess are together and then she has her lover and then he ends up going off with someone else the girl sophie and then the princess finds out and then then like the prince finds out she's cheating on him so it's just kind of like you know it keeps going on and on but i think it's patched together pretty well Uh, i don't know it's not a faulty film. I mean, I'd like to see the musical, no, the opera, just to know about it. Because I know I've heard of Der Rosenkavalier before. Oh, you have? Okay. I've never heard of it. Yeah. Myself. It's like um the... <sighs> I already never remember anything ever. What's the... Carmen? Is that the other famous musical? Something like that? I don't know. It's like, I know of famous musicals. So, I don't know. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Carmen is a, a a musical, yeah. It's an opera. Yeah, it's an uh, opera. In... Made into uh, I... silent film, made into sound film. Yeah, yeah. It's been done over and over again. Right. And uh, the music is so attracting... And so easy accessible, you find yourself humming Carmen without even realizing that you're doing it. Right. It's uh I think it's in four acts. Mm-hmm. That's what it French says. composer uh George Bizet. It's written by a bunch of people. But the point is, uh yeah, absolutely. Uh I I, I think I mentioned it earlier. It really in terms of the story and plot line reminds me a lot of the Shakespearean comedies mm. like A Midsummer's Night Dream, Twelfth Night, any of those, All's Well, Ends Well, Comedy of Errors, As You Like It, like 
this sort of prototypical characters uh, miscommunicating and a ton of just um, just really funny parts of just uh, characters not really speaking what they're thinking and what they're feeling until something forces them in their character's lifespan to change or alter course. So yeah, all of that just... I found all of that incredible. So the actual opera uh, for The Night of the Rose, uh, you know, debuted in 1911, which is about uh, 15 years prior to this film. And uh, it was done in three acts. Now, that story actually departs quite differently than this. Obviously, it's a lot more... Uh, it's 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 obviously more theatrical and made for the stage there are three separate acts and in, in taking place in three separate scenes the first one is just in the the main princess's uh uh bedroom and that's like act one act two is at the sophie's sort of uh palace the von uh Faninals, the guy who inherited the uh it was ennobled uh because of some political bureaucracy or something like that. So he's not like true aristocracy. That's that's Act Two. Uh, Sophie's the daughter who is the rose, the, the silver rose was presented to the object of Octavian's obje- uh, objection, um, obsession. Um, and the third one is the setup, right at the ending, where they basically set up the the lecherous character Oaks and so on. So it, it, that's three separate acts, uh, and they take place in sort of different things happen in different parts of it. And I think the film does, uh, shows a little bit more than those, the, the, the operetta, and then shows a lot more, toward, especially towards the end, because the ending of the opera itself only has Octavian and Sophie having a happy ending. The rest of the other two couples didn't really receive anything. So... That's the difference between this and the the feature film. Um, the differences. What I will say is, though, at the very end, I don't know if you guys noticed, when the music stopped and then you have that intertitle saying the last something like 10 or 15 minutes is lost. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. It was just all of a sudden you're like, oh. Oh, that, but that's, I can tell you, that's unfortunately very common. Um, not the last part, but just missing parts of film. And that, yes. Films getting re, uh, what's the word? Re, readjusted, reconstituted, re, uh, I don't know if there's t- rest, not restored, restored, restored well, is re- the only restored, yes, in terms of the film quality, but also like, um, they basically put up, uh, the available footage that they have and also still photography if they have the publicities. Uh, and then the intertitles, if they have them, basically they uh, uh, strive to tell as much of the original story as possible, uh, given whatever they have left. They basically re, uh, I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, like re reconstituted, yeah, for lack of a better term. <laughs> like lemon juice. Actually, yeah. this was a lot sweeter than lemon juice for me when that moment happened and it, the screen went black. And it was silent before the uh, they let us know that this was the end of the what existed. It just it cut it off completely. It it really it was kind of a shock. You really wanted to finish it. You wanted to see the end of it. And I think they handled it very well. I think that Strauss's music was superb. I think those little bits and pieces, because that's what it was, little bits and pieces that they found to wrap up the film, to give it some kind of fullness, it worked for me. It might not have worked for somebody else, but given all the grandeur uh, of this particular costume picture, um, and it was really grand, uh I think that they pulled it off very, very well because uh, to set up the an entire orchestra to restructure this, you know, to restructure this film 
was a magnificent act in itself. I think the orchestration was really wonderful. And that's really what fed the film for me as well. I know that Lily has said in the past, well, the music, you know, the music's not right. And I agree with her. Music's not right. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. This one was really good, though. It fit, you know, it just blended really well. They know what they're doing because they're watching the screen. So absolutely all of that. I I, I also want to, I don't know if you got my email, Lily, earlier, but I sent you a video of uh, the 2001 Space Odyssey I did see it, but I didn't look at it. But did you hear the 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 score? No, not yet. Okay, if you listen to it, like you'd immediately recognize it because so many of uh, Strauss's themes is still be in use in terms of for many many things, whether it's advertisement or the current media. He, like I said, because he's the successor of all those classical composers, uh, he likes to utilize very romantic type themes uh, in terms of classical uh, music. And there's a thing called the leitmotif, which is like this ability to have very strong uh, melodies for his uh, music that just, it it lends itself naturally to film uh, and storytelling. And that's why it was like a great match between him and, and not just the operetta, but this particular film, even though... I read another review of uh, uh, like an opera review that reviews operas professionally. Mm-hmm. They kind of turn their nose at the film because, <laughs> of course, yeah. their biases. They want everybody to see the stage itself, right? But I would say that uh, he kind of, the composer Strauss revolutionized uh, even modern music, especially if you talk to uh, uh, Max Steiner and uh, Bernard Herrmann and all of those uh, people who did like stuff like Gone with the Wind and Casablanca and many, many classic film scores all the way through like John Williams. You know that name at least, right? Like mm-hmm. the theme of Star Wars. Oh, yeah. They Star all Wars used his technique, the, the, the notion of the light motif, like da 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 Like it's so mel- melodic. It's so memorable. It's so strong. And that allows the... Uh, person enjoying that piece of artwork whether it is an opera or the film medium or now tv but uh, in radio and on and on and on uh whatever you're watching that story allow it, basically this the music draws you into it and allows the emotions to take weight and that's his contribution i think not mm. to just this work the night of the rose but to all of the music that we know of now in terms of mo- modern classical music highly influential I'm not saying he's the be all and end all and on everything because there are definitely others, but his influence is pretty great, uh, especially when it comes to film music and melodies of film scoring and music. Does that make sense? Makes uh, oh, sense. yeah. So super fascinating, too. Yeah. And so it, it is why the music is is like so amazing in, in when you transition scenes, it, it has different themes for different characters. Even though that snooty opera review <laughs> mm-hmm. said that uh, it's basically a hodgepodge collection of all his previously per, uh, performed works, which is true because he already did the work for yeah. the opera itself. So we're taking kind of the the uh, bits and pieces of it, and it is being reorchestrated for the film by another person. Seems like. Oh, it's like the comment I made last week about the film critics making critiques about film was like, well, do you do film or do you just talk about film? Shut up and get in there and figure it out. <laughs> you know, because obviously they're going to be like, oh, it's, you know, pish posh. It's right. like, well, are you writing amazing scores? No, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, it, it, I think it, to me personally, it, it, the film itself, because of the music and the way it's all put together, I... I've never heard of it. I haven't seen it before, but it's to me, it's one of the best silent films I've ever seen. It's at that height. And uh, because of things that uh, Diane talked about, because the thing about silent films is, you're right, Lily, it, it, it ultimately really is about how the music influences you. It's really half the movie, you know? And uh, 
if you've got a great score, especially like this one from a master of like great, you know, classical music composition that innovated uh, in his era, well, that's already, it's already half won. <laughs> but mm. above and beyond that, one of the things that I really enjoy about this film was not just the story and not just uh, sort of operatic, quote unquote, acting and all those different things, but also that it really takes you through everything. Uh, you've got like, uh, you know, it starts with the character, all about the character and then some of the story and backgrounds that the characters take you through. But then it goes to like the prince uh, winning the war and victory. And that, even though it was only like a few minutes long, that scene it was tremendous. Like that whole war scene, who knew like Robert Wynn could pull that off? Because a great chunk of this film had a lot of exteriors, which I was shocked by because I would assume like many of his previous films he would do interior and control all the sets right and the lighting and everything but there's so much exterior to this film right lots of lots of nature lots of sun ocean mountains uh, waters lots of hills lots of battles uh, it's it's a sweeping epic drama right you talk about epics this is one of the epics uh, of the silent era there were many right that but this is coming towards the tail end it, end of it and it uh, I mean, I haven't seen it, but it's probably going to be something like the Abel Gantz's uh, Napoleon. You know, I, have you seen that one, Diane? Or you, oh have you yes, heard about it, right? absolutely. You've seen the yes. seven-hour cut or five hours? I've seen the five-hour cut. <laughs> <laughs> it gets they find more and more and more of it, and it's a magnificent film, absolutely magnificent. But do you know what I'm talking about when I reference that? Because I feel like the that segment where the prince is at war. Reminds me a lot of that, that feeling, right? When you watch a scope, an epic scope like that, right? Well, I was too busy concentrating on the the storyline that was happening in the palace and the palace grounds, and um, and basically, um, at least this is just from my perspective that. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, while her husband is becoming famous in the war and, uh, that's sort of like he goes off, you know, ta -ra, ta -ra, ta -ra, ta -ra, ta -ra, and they show some of the war. I wasn't overwhelmed by that aspect of the film because the story was still taking place at the palace, uh, where everybody else was partying hardy. And um, it's like one gigantic ball is what it is. And with a lot of little sub stories that are going on inside of it, um, you've got a masked ball, you've got uh, uh, love affairs happening uh, in, in little rooms and corners. And, um, and then you've got the comedy that, that weaves its way through all of this plot that's going on um it was it was just an all over it was a beautiful film it the the war scenes itself did not really catch my eyes so much as i was watching for soldiers to die i know that sounds weird but you know when you no, I understand sh mm. shooting yeah. going on and all that sort of thing um what what i meant to communicate is that the, the scope of the film wasn't just limited to like the palace intrigue. What I mean to say is that it included other things too that expanded uh, the scope of the story that I don't think was in the original operetta, right? Right. So um, that's the, I think that's the beautiful thing about this film is that, it, that it, it was possible to not just have the characters having uh, intricate uh, sort of complicated relationships in sort of the aristocratic, arist you know, not pronounce that word now, but aristocratic <laughs> society, but it's, it's aristocracy rather, and but rather just uh, the whole uh, expansion of the the, the scope of the storyline is that all of a sudden you got this prince's he he's been like out of the picture for a long time, and all of a sudden he cuts to 
his struggles and his things, and all of a sudden he, you know, he wins a victory, and he doesn't even. Uh, I think the purpose of that is to show the grand grandeur of the 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 the, the epic and hundreds of soldiers, right? Just for a few minutes of film, but also once all of that is done, and he doesn't feel like the victory uh, effect. The victory wasn't a, a victory in my, his mind, even though it was good for his professional career. It didn't feel like his life was it, it felt like his own personal life was falling apart and so he was like that's why he was like victory 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 and then he was like give me a coach to vienna straight away he really needed to come home and part of the ratcheting up that drama was basically saying what's he gonna do when he gets home you know what i mean he was a stiff character to me though right in comparison to the other characters in the film and i was waiting for him to sort of come back into the scene and become part of the intrigue, as you say. Um, but he never did. He never really did do that. Um, we were already taken away by all the uh, sex hormones that were flying around that castle. Mm -hmm. And um, and it seemed like over the... Uh, they seem to hold sway over the whole their whole world, but that's just what I. Yeah, I mean, I believe he was simply a plot device to get to the ending. Uh, he wasn't. I I think that specific character wasn't the original opera, and that's why he wasn't as fully developed compared to the, all the other characters, right? Right. So he was. He wasn't even there, and so he's kind of an add-on. And that's what happens when you try to pad some of the story. But be that as it may, I, I greatly enjoyed it. Like you said, when the ending uh, came, it was a shock and a surprise. And like you said, I also enjoyed the ending, the recon reconstructed ending. Reconstructed. Maybe that's the word I was thinking. But, uh, uh, but you know, Diane, you can speak a little bit into that. It's like for a lot of silent films, large and small or known or unknown, it's very common to have re... re uh, Reconstruction. Reconstruction. Entire like that, films, right? entire right. films have been reconstructed. Greed, completely reconstructed. Not completely because we don't have 40 reels of reconstruction, but through photographs and camera angles and music, um, I was very satisfied with the reconstruction of greed. Um, I don't know if other people were. But um, that's going to be one of those films that we will never see the whole thing. It was just, it's to the four winds, whatever's missing. And if we do find it, because I need to be optimistic of the, about these things, I will certainly be pleased. Um, they did the same thing with London After Midnight. They had hundreds of photographs. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Rick Schmidlin who worked on Greed, also worked on London After Midnight, starring Lon Chaney, and um, used the photographs to try to reconstruct the film, but it still, it still fell short. Uh, it, it was, it was also known not to be that one, that great of a Chaney film. Um, but uh, I was much more satisfied with the with Greed and what he was able to do with that. He worked with a lot. There is another. Gentleman, um, I'm trying. To, his name is Philip Dye, and he wanted to reconstruct uh, Theta Barra's Cleopatra, which is one of the most sought after lost silent films today, and which people get very excited over, even if they see one photograph from that film. And he wasn't able to do it, unfortunately, even with the hundreds of stills that he was able to procure. So he had to turn it into a book, which, you know, fell short of his dream, which is a shame because he was beginning to build with what he had, um, but uh, he didn't make it. Um, but he had to do something with all the hours that he had put into and all the time uh, and effort that he had put into restoring or reconstructing, because there is there is a difference between restoring and reconstructing something, in my mind. I don't know about you. Yeah, that's kind of the, the thing I was trying to get at, Lily, is that even quite a number of films we already reviewed 
on this podcast, there are many of those that have had reconstructed scenes. Uh, I believe one of the, oh, I don't remember the name, but one of the shorts that we watched where him, with him going up this uh, swimming pool and he dives and misses the pool and lands like straight oh, through that one. the ground. Uh, oh, that was goes... one of the uh, Buster Keaton movies. Buster Keaton, yeah, where he basically goes to China and comes back. Hard luck. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. Hard and luck. So that's an example of like they hadn't found the lost footage, but they reconstructed it with stills and bits and pieces. And of course, they ended up finding it years later. And then now it's in the media that we have. But the point is that reconstruction is a common thing with sound, just because the virtue of how much volume of sound films are lost. And so. On one hand, it did surprise me for this particular movie, neither of us, but on the other, it didn't. So, but in either instance, um, and it was like, I thought to myself, well, of course it had to be the ending, right? Because the most, <laughs> to me, the most important part where you want to see how everything wraps up, which, which I think it sounded like it tied up like with a happy ending, this particular film. <laughs> I think and, it did. Uh, yeah. I liked it. I don't need a... Uh... A downer at the end of a film. Right. Especially one like this that was meant to be a comedy in the first place. Right. It right. reminded me very much of, um, there were some scenes in there that reminded me of. Um, oh, uh, Mozart, right? This is by Mozart. Mozart, Mozart yeah. yes. There's a scene in this particular film where they're doing a play on the stage and it's uh again very shakespearean right he does a lot very shakespearean yes and um it's about the baron being made fun of in his quest to be with a young woman to marry a young woman and buy her from her father and uh he recognizes that he's the one that's being japed and um but the what's going on stage is absolutely hilarious to me. I thought that was one of the the funnier aspects of the uh of the film and it it did remind me of the kind of plays that Mozart uh would do. Mozart wasn't just a serious composer, he was also a composer of uh comedy opera as well. And um so it still has that kind of uh flavor to it so yeah i personally like this one far above uh caligari any of the other robert wing works that we have thus far seen so I, it's got my vote for sure um anyway uh do you guys have any parting thoughts about it or any additional thoughts well, somebody really did their homework in the lives of of the court. Um, there was, uh, besides the balls and the parties that were going on and the big picnics and the way that they entertained themselves, there was, there was a lot of ballet going on in this. And um, this is the way that royalty entertained themselves. This was not for the common... Um, the common individual this was this was royal stuff and they did they trained in ballet and they trained in different arts that was just for the royal families and the royal uh community and i enjoyed the ballet that they were that they were doing in one of the scenes of the uh now that had a lot of people in it too that was a a a scene of hundreds, maybe a, f- a few thousand people that was pulled off and very well done. The aristocracy, right? The aristocracy, in yes, yeah. and their life was really well done. Um, I was a- a gasping at the costumes. I thought the costumes were uh, absolutely... They were phenomenal. They were phenomenal. Uh, the wedding gown, uh, supposed to be the wedding night for one of our characters and that gown just woo I mm-hmm. was just amazed and all she got was a kiss on the hand because her husband had to leave to go to war by 
and she had gotten all dolled up. I mean, more than dolled up. That gown was was incredible in its creation. Um, and that's what she had, who he had left behind was a woman in love and ready to uh, start off in, in that world of sexual love and um, and marriage. And it had to go someplace. So it yeah, went to all the hero. costumes were amazing. Absolutely, yes, they were. They, it, that's why I was talking about von Stroheim's films, where he liked to get the costumes just right, right, right down to their underwear. <laughs> and that's where he got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, though. You have to get the petticoats right. You have to get every fine detail because if it's off hey someone's gonna know because there's i'm sure there were quote-unquote nerds back then too <laughs> or you know enthusiasts of well, that culture in that time it was i think to transition from i mean there's still aristocracy today like you know england and a bunch of other european countries i'm sure there's still some kind of left in the world uh Largely bygone, of course, now. But in the earliest, uh, the earlier 20th century, there were a whole lot more. I think a lot of countries were changing from the aristocratic society into a more democratic type, and due to revolutions and on. So politically, there were a lot of things that were changing. But it wouldn't surprise me if there were still a fair number of people. Uh, maybe they might know some of these specific things. Like I remember the scene in this film where because the F Fennell family, the, the dad and Sophie, they were new to aristocracy. So they didn't know all the details. And so they had to have a guy come in and say, you would curtsy this way. And uh, somebody is going to present the rose. And exactly 11 minutes later, you know, come with the record, like all these details to, to tell them, like they had to be tell told. Uh, what to do and what yes. those social mores were because they didn't know they, they've been uh, granted these things. And so like that little detail was pretty significant. This actually all reminds me of uh, Luciano uh, Visconti, the director uh, and artisan for a bunch of movies, Italian movies uh, about ro royalty and aristocracy. Uh, the Leopard, 1963. What was the other one he did that I saw? <sighs> the Leopard, definitely. Oh, uh, Senso. I think Senso. 1954? It's got to be this one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, there's a couple of um, Italian historic dramas where this director, you know, uh, Visconti, would make about uh, a lot of which is the passing of aristocracy, aristocratic society into sort of the modern era. And these stories were about these aristocratic aristocrats and what, how they were going to live through these transitions. What's interesting he is he himself was an aristocracy who made that transition. So he put his a lot of his personal life. Lee Hood into some of these films that he made yeah, about the loss. Uh, kind of, he's got a nostalgia for aristocracy. So in some sense, this movie reminds me, of course, this is much earlier than the, the films that he was making, which again, wouldn't surprise me if this film influenced his stuff. <laughs> like all What's, history, right? Tell me if I'm right or wrong. Was Strauss, the, the opera took place not took place but uh, Strauss created the opera 15 years before the film and produced it 15 years before the film came out was he involved at all in the music for the film itself oh, I think so Richard Strauss yeah yeah this these are all original scores of his but w but was he but he so he was involved in the film oh absolutely yeah that's what makes it really special. Yeah. That's what makes it very, very special. Um, in addition to, I mean, this was his baby all the way. 
Yeah. And he and he was even willing to take it to the screen. Um, George Bernard Shaw didn't want to take his films to the screen. He just wanted to stay on the written page. And um, but he was convinced uh, by which was Gabriel based Pascal. On Gabriel Pascal, thank you yeah. very, very much. Now I can sleep tonight. Um, how much uh, GBS would have hated the ending of uh, My Fair Lady in compared to Pygmalion, which was much truer to what he wanted to get across in his story. Um, and that was a 1938 film with... Um, um oh, oh, my mind it's melting um leslie howard playing uh professor higgins and wendy hiller playing um liza doolittle so there i got my mind back together so that's exciting to me that strauss was involved in the silent film that to me makes it richer and better and it just wasn't something that was separate from a work that he did 50 years before the film came out. It's a G.B. Shaw kind of thing, too, where he was involved in allowing um, somebody else to take his films or to take his stories and put them on the screen, which I can really appreciate. In fact, uh, that Opera House uh, at Dresden... Uh, Simpor Roper. The, the opera house is where the initial debut of the operetta, like th that was the initial place where the operetta itself debuted. So the, really? the, the operetta itself debuted at this opera house, which is why it kind of made a point to highlight that in Dresden with uh, the creator Hoff Hoffman and also the uh, Hoffmanstall and also who wrote the the work uh in terms of the written story and page and stuff like that oh, the, the, the actual Roberto, music yes. but the music itself was by Richard Strauss and he was there conducting that in 1911 when they debuted and premiered that whole thing and now 15 years afterwards again 1926 in January they premiered the film with Robert Ween and all the company so they did it the same exact place but instead of a, a play uh, operetta it's now a a film and he uh he was there at the premiere uh in fact the uh tidbit i guess trivia is that the music during the film's performance was provided by an orchestra at the premiere this was conducted by strauss himself the film's projection speed had to be adjusted by the projector in order to fit the speed of the orchestra because i guess this is a i'm not a fan of you know strauss i mean i don't listen to his stuff like you know on spotify <laughs> regularly <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> what i'm saying is that uh it, of what i read strauss tends to like his music's fast like he likes to play even old material like super at super speed and so that it would explain the problem here the the film's uh, projection speed has to be adjusted by the projector in order to fit the speed of the orchestra this task fell fell to the film's cameraman hans Andersen. Yes. Because only he knew the exact length of each scene and cut. And later performances, a special recording, also conducted by Strauss, provided the music. Strauss conducted the Vienna and London premieres and recorded excerpts for the film score, from the film score on the Victoria, Victoria label at that time. A planned tour of the United States in 1927 by Strauss and his orchestra failed to go ahead because of the emergence of sound films. So, there you have it. It's quite interesting and of course you know it has done a few premieres uh, you know since then and if you watch the recording on the dvd which captured a performance a reconstruction of the film and performance and i don't know who the conductor is but i don't remember but uh there's a dvd recording of that event itself uh which is from the late 2000 like uh 2006 2008 sometime like that so the DVD, again, went to the same opera house. And again, debuted the film many decades later. 
Wow, um, I love again, that. So they did the same exact thing, which is why I really enjoyed it because it really felt like you put yourself. You, I love that they, they capture the event. It's not so much that the film, which was great too, but it really felt like a concert to me. Because if you listen to the score on the oh eight oh six reconstruction, it really felt like you were listening to it. Was it was live? So re- they recorded that performance like live. So I love that. Because you know, like I was saying, trying to make a point earlier, silent films, you really have to treat them like a concert. And if you ever been to any concert, a concert, every concert is a unique experience unto itself. It, only happens uh, even if the same band plays, you know, a hundred shows. I'm making it up, but if they play a hundred shows in a year, every one of those hundred shows is a unique experience, right? That you know, person A, even if person A attends like two of those, no two concerts are the same, right?、Mm-hmm. And I think it's the same with silent films. Is you could watch the same movie with two separate.、Uh, Uh, performances, even if it is by the same band, but it would be two separate experiences, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, because、uh, especially if you have two different accompanists, you know they're gonna see things differently, and I don't know, maybe. No, what I'm saying is, even if it's the same accompanist, if this everything is the same exact thing, it's still、oh, like yeah, again a all, music、um, concert, like a band.、Yeah. Concert. It depends on the energy、yeah. of the crowd, exactly. Too, if they're into the film or not, because、yeah. one, yeah, yeah, it's the same thing with any theater performance. Yeah. And you know, I think you, Diane, probably have attended a lot more live performances of silent films than I have. I've only been to a handful. <laughs> I'm sure. I can't.、Uh-huh. Uh, if you think they're wonderful, they are wonderful. Yeah. There's no doubt about.、It. There's no.、Uh, nothing to compare to having live music with a film. It's its own art form. It's its own art form. Even separate and apart from modern movies, I I feel like it's it's a. That's why I often use that analogy. That it is kind of like live concert. Essentially, it really is. A musical performance that you attend live,、uh, with in conjunction with the film, that entire thing is an experience. And if you can, you know, it it is always great to be able to attend those to to gain an appreciation for silent films. That's right. Very, very、yeah. exciting. Very exciting. I feel bad now that we're in the COVID that、um, a lot of people do not have access. To seeing the films that way in this time, because、uh, it's such a, a grand, wonderful, inexplicable—can't even explain it—how wonderful it is. Actually, Bob and I were originally planning to go to、uh, Metropolis, the complete cut、uh, performance with the Alloy Orchestra with their. Oh, really? Uh, modernized、mm-hmm. score, which I really enjoyed.、Uh, in April, of course, yeah, it, it got canceled. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. That would have been wonderful. It would have been yes. Where was that going to be? Was that in Boston? Yeah, that was going to be in Beverly. Yeah, I was、oh, like、okay. actually trying to acquire tickets for it. I, I did text you, but I think you were、uh, busy that night, that particular evening, or something. Probably, yeah. Because I would have gone. I mean, I know one twenty eight. You know, obviously, since working in Salem, so I would have been like, yes. Yeah, but what I'm <laughs> saying is that,、uh, you know, unfortunately, we're in this sort of pandemic situation. But if it weren't for that, I I just think that any、uh, performances of silent films is worth going to. Even like the worst ones is still worth going to because it's that connection of. Like live music in a film, there's some sort of a strange alchemy that occurs when you can enjoy a silent film that way. That's again totally unique、uh, for this silent film era compared to even modern music, mo- modern、um, score in modern films. 
Anywho, I think we could probably go on, but this is, uh, to me, it is an amazing piece of film, especially the live performance capture like we were just talking about. And, uh, it's almost uh, unfathomable that I would see something of his, Robert Wynn's, surpass Dr. Caligari, but here we are. <laughs> I really do enjoy the uh, comedy and the drama and the different sort of highs and lows and the different characters ebb and flow in this particular work and also the the music and score rendition were astonishing uh setting up the stage for film scores for decades to come ultimately it was Uh, pretty darn close to a live performance for me yeah it really felt like a modern movie in in many ways Uh, it didn't especially with robert wynn's technical abilities just didn't feel like it was a movie from the 1920s. Like it really felt closer to something that was uh, in my lifetime. (laughs) At least that's how I enjoyed it. Even with the reconstruction of the ending. Because I love how... was beautiful. Yeah, even with that, I feel like that taps into your imagination a lot more, which I really enjoyed. How you would like in your imagination... Uh, connect the dots. There are, Lily, by the way, entire films reconstructed with still photography and intertitle uh, text, and that's it. That they have zero footage of the film. Like um, That's crazy. Yeah, like F.W. Myrna's The Four Devils is a movie that he made in the Hollywood studio system because he was from Germany, and mm-hmm. this is post the rise of the Nazi, and he basically bailed, and now he's in the U.S., so he's made a bunch of movies, but he made this one called The Four Devil, and it's supposed to be an amazing piece of work. But it's lost to time lost. so far. Yes. And, so far. Uh, but they've done a 90-minute reconstruction using stills. There's a huge amount of production stills and publicity photos um, and scripts and so on. So they reconstruct, and I, I loved it. Even though it's reconstructed and I know it, I use my imagination. It was almost like I watched the movie. I didn't, but it was like, you know what I mean? So yes, yes. Yeah, I wrote um, that down, so I'll check it out. Do we know if it's on YouTube or? I know it was part of a DVD because I have the um, F.W. Myrna's DVD. So mm. one of the movies has that. I don't know if it's on YouTube or anywhere, but uh, anyways, I'm just using that as an illustration that that's the desire of so many silent film fans is that they want to see these movies, but they're not available. And in lieu of that, the reconstructions sometimes better than nothing at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Well, with this film, you know, at the very end, like we were saying, uh, especially the prince's character, I feel with him not being seen with outside of those stills, you know, it kind of summed up what he did anyway, which is not much. You know, that's his most bold move when he's fighting uh, the other guy, uh, Octavian, I think is his name. But it's just, you know, because it's in a still frame. I don't know. I kind of felt like, oh, okay, good enough. <laughs> Just because of he was kind of the plot device. Right. I thought he was going to kill him because I've never uh, seen or read about the play. So I didn't know how it was going to end. <laughs> so it felt like he was on the path because he's, you know, uh, a seasoned soldier and, you know, an uh, aristocrat who uses a sword for fun is not going to beat a, a seasoned soldier, right? Who's now a general or something. Mm-hmm. And so I really thought he was just going to kill him outright. <laughs> That'd well, be the ending. I mean, I would say we never know, but we do know how it ends because right. the intertitle cards told us, oh, they get all together. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy endings for all. Happy endings. Yeah. Yay. All right. Any parting thoughts? I mean, it's a beautiful film. I really enjoyed it. It, it, One of my favorites, for sure. I'm with you. Yeah, I I would watch this one again. Maybe maybe on a bigger screen. (laughs) I mean, just in a way that you can kind of respect it a little more. You know, we only can view them so well, depending on our (laughs) viewing devices i mean obviously i didn't watch this on my phone but then that way you can just get more of the experience of the sound matching with the what's on screen yeah 
but also I think that um, there's I, know, I think there's something epic about this film obviously the big screen works too but there, I think the key here is the the music component that's it's so unique to this film I can't think of any other silent film that has a world class well renowned like Mozart, Beethoven level composer composing original score for. I just can't think of any other silent films. Do you know of any? Uh, this Zion? is pretty. This is pretty unique. Yeah, I, I can't think of any other silent films where the where the composer is this like Mozart, Beethoven level guy who is just out of this world amazing. You know that that wrote the scores for it. True, you don't really hear like geniuses, musical geniuses anymore. Yeah. So, there are so many other uh, maybe tangents of stories that we could explore. Like the the guy who plays the the cousin of the princess, um, orc oaks or something. Oh, the Baron Ox. Ox, yeah. So he, in real life, is actual an, a real life opera singer. And hmm. if you look at the behind the scenes stuff or read a little bit into it, all of the uh, they basically filmed this movie like the opera. So the actors they weren't actually just dialoguing; they were actually basically performing and singing uh, all of their parts. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't notice the singing part. Yeah, so if you watch it again, I knew that beforehand, and so I, I, I was, I was astonished. It's, it's such a minor detail, but once you watch it again, you'll notice everybody's basically singing it, like that uh, letter carry in the beginning, going to Oak's estate. That he was, he wasn't just yelling or bellowing; he was singing. Like at the top of his lungs, his part. Okay, that's what he was. I was very confused by, you know, what he was doing with his mouth. (laughs) I was just like, are you hollering? What are you you doing? Yeah, that's what I thought too. Yeah. (laughs) And they were all doing that, basically. They were performing essentially the operetta. That, you know, that's how the great directors do it. They do go for authenticity, even though they know at that point in time that they weren't going to record that audio portion and attach it to the final product. They still did I, it. <laughs> I saw a live performance of Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney uh, several years ago. And there's a part for... Like on video, right? Not in, in person, right? No, this was in person. I saw this uh, staged... Um, it, it was a live performance. And in the film, there is a, a soprano who sings an aria and they brought a live soprano on stage to sing the part to sing her part in the film right and it was absolutely amazing the way they were able to pull that off and and sync it together and it it just turned it into a 3d experience right you watched a a capture playback of the original performance right you didn't attend a physical performance with lon cheney is my question Oh no! Oh yeah. no! No no! I That's what I, I was uh, asking. I, no, no, no! I'm not that old. That's what I was. That's what I figured. <laughs> yeah. Now this was this was a wonderful uh, evening that I had uh, many years ago that I will always treasure. It was uh, one of those unique evenings that uh, you can't redo. You got to be there. All right. Well, that's what I was saying. I, I'm really glad that somebody preserved that uh, performance of the score for this film. You know, doing everything Absolutely. right, essentially. Yes. So, but anyways, I, I was trying to go. You know, I, again, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna dig into it. But there, are, uh, that character, the Oaks character in real life, was a opera singer who actually roomed up with. Uh, basically, they all sort of all of these artisans and creators involved with this film and many others because of the where they're at in that you know german australian uh, not australian austrian (laughs) uh region they've all had to contend with the rise of hitler and nazism and how they reacted um to the regime 
you know, because some of them actually just stayed behind and lived through everything instead of just、uh, leaving the region and the area and coming back to it. So, anyways, so they all have had different sort of responses to、uh, sort of what happens, you know, in that area. Anyways, but we don't have to get into it. <laughs> Well, I feel I must dance a waltz, sing an aria, and find a lover at the same time. <laughs> That's what it makes me feel like. Yes, yes. Anywho, so that's、uh, that's our take on it.、Um, if you guys have any parting thoughts, if not, we can wrap up the podcast. Do you guys have any parting thoughts other than what we communicated? It's a good ending for a Robert Wien adventure. <laughs> yes, I like doing that because then, like, I mean, as far as at this time of recording, it feels good to complete something. I think it's good to complete going through his filmography and kind of checking that box off. <laughs> At least it does for me. So, all right, cool. So. Uh, that concludes our podcast for today, and、uh, thank you, listeners. Thank you, uh, uh, Lily and Diane. And you can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms dot pre-、uh, dot wordpress dot com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilms plural dot wordpress dot com. And you can send us an email at watchingsilentfilms at gmail dot com. Please leave a rating or a review on our Apple Podcast platform or anywhere you find our podcast. You can find more of that and stuff at、uh, the Silence Plural Majority、uh, Wakeback Machine as a Facebook group. Just for a search for that, and you'll、uh, see a bunch of very interesting、uh, throwback to the Silent Era. And that's all we have for this week. So thanks again, listeners. Thank you again, Lily and Diane. This episode was produced by Lily and Edward Mayfong. Bye bye.